coastline, which runs across the Netherlands, Belgium and France, is awash with compelling stories. The sea is crucial in shaping the landscapes and identities of the region. The Netherlands is one place that has benefited from the sea, but has also experienced its dangers firsthand. Kortina is a small town in the Dutch province of Zeeland, situated on the former island Nordbeverland, and houses around 2,000 inhabitants. Kiz and Yanni have a lot of memories of their hometown. We enjoy the possibility to play outside, always in the nature. We were always in the nature when uh, we were young, we, we, we went to the fields uh, to see the birds and uh, fishing in the ditches and, and uh, walking together and especially swimming in the outside. Uh, uh, other side of the dike when the tide came up and we drove with the water, we drove into the country. And then, but it was the special uh, island feeling, and that's that, that's typical. Uh, that's it's, uh, it's very uh, very difficult to explain that. That's uh, yeah. Uh, um, I'm always glad that I've been born and lived on an island. In 1953, a horrible flood struck the province of Zeeland where 1835 people lost their lives. 6 years is it geleden that the storm ramp over het zuidwesten van ons land kwam. In deze dagen zullen er velen zijn die zich de beelden van onbeschrijfelijk verdriet herinneren. Vooral in het rampgebied zelf zal men nu terugdenken aan die februari dagen waarin het zeewater met onstuitbare kracht bezit nam van het vruchtbare land en van de levens van 1795 van zijn bewoners. My name is Van der Linde. So you can see, I lived here. <laughs> that was the, my old uncle who lived here. And then we, we moved in. So I grew up here, over here. I was 23 when the, uh, when the catastrophe came over our country. Yeah, that's a night I shall never forget. The, uh, the new city hall was built and was opened that day. And uh, I was asked, because I, uh, I have worked with a newspaper, I was asked to make a, a reportage of it. But that night, the day before, I got it in, in the back, I couldn't leave the bed. And then, uh, the night of the, of the catastrophe, my brother came into the house and he said, come to the harbour, come to the harbour, the water is coming. When the water came, the neighbours had warned us, found, ah, the water is here. So they came to us and then we saw collapse the dike where just now the bridge is. So we uh, and then there came a car who was in the in the hole and it was two uh, little boys out of the out, out of the car and they uh, they drank and the, the mother and one son I brought in and my father had the, the the husband and he survived too, and the mother and one, one kid also, and the other kids they flew away. The people automatically looked for a high place. And what was a high place? That was from all sides of the village to see. That was the mill. In the quarter of uh, a quarter of time, uh, this village was full. That it was full of water, and they had to here to the water. They had coming to to, to that mill. And my father said to the, to the women, go upstairs and go sit there and the men stay down. And it was a dark night and it was very windy, very stormy weather. And in the middle of the night, some men stood outside and they said there is coming one boy, he's swimming. He come. And he was a boy of 15 years old and he came from the Toren there and he said our house was trembling. And I said to my parents, I jump off the house. It's, it's too dangerous to stay in here. No, no, you can't, stand, you can't do that. But he did, and his parents and his brother and sister died that night. Upstairs we had a bath, and that was full of water. So we fled on, on, the, on the loft. And we were there, so we had water, we had uh, ham, we had some apples, 
So we could uh, we could stay for a few days, and then someone came with a boat, and we uh, we were saved. And all that people at the Torendijk, the dike that was 500 meters behind the houses, that dike broke, and this was a wall from five meters high, and the water reaches the houses and they tumble down. And in that minute, in the same minute, all the people died. <coughs> died at the same time. And the next morning, we looked and we saw water, water and water. And we saw no life, we saw no cars, we saw no people. We saw some people sitting on the roofs. Even didn't see birds. It was quiet and quiet and quiet and we had to make it for ourselves. And now, shall I show you where the horses were in the old barn? I think I can't go in. Yeah! It changed a lot, of course. Here were the, the little cows, and there was the cows, and then you. Uh, Go on, and there were the, the horses. This was all the water, and also over. And I, I told you the cows all lay down. That, and the horses they were going to the to the dike. So it was, but all that was packed up here, and the the, the products yeah, they were lost, and it was rotten. And when it got light. We succeeded in getting a boat, and the next days we uh, we worked hard to get the people of the houses, evacuated people to other villages who who, who were dry. And there was a man we uh, in the boat. And he was 80 years old, and he said he sat on the roof of his little house, uh, just wearing a shirt and and, uh, and short trousers. And he sat there for eight hours. But there were people uh, who they didn't uh, want to go, but they had to. And after a fortnight, it was dry enough to come back. Here you can see the salt that's in the wall. It was not so high, the water over here. It was still uh, till my throat. Then uh, one time we had uh, we were a bit a bit hungry, so my father said or my mother said, "Go down, you can swim." <laughs> and then, but it was so cold. But they had bread and they had uh, something otherwise to eat. So uh, it was still here. We had lots of help from. Militaries, from soldiers, uh, from other people who came here. All the, the, the personal uh, things of the people lay on the street. And here in this village was a café, the Graaf van Buren. And this was, it was dry, there was uh, very little water in it. And there they came, the people from around, get food there and uh, medical help. Uh, Etc. And you see the people come in. They didn't see the father or mother anymore. They lost their family. They lost friends. Then we came, there, came back to the house after two or three months. There was a, a sand over there, and, 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 and clay, and so it was a step up to go inside. And then one time I saw a little boy was found over here. So we all the time went in on the little step on the little kid. So that was a, a hard, hard uh, experience. So. Uh, there was, uh, yeah, 30, 39 people were, yeah, uh, died and they were buried here. We, we knew the people, it's a, 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 that's here a little community. And uh, the first years after the catastrophe, uh, there was in the church also a remembrance of, of, of that day. And it's still 
Uh, it was this year, it was 60 years ago. And is the church absolutely full of all the people there who live and elsewhere they come they come here to to that place and yeah they meet each other again. Those were the days that we talk about before the ramp, the catastrophe, and after the catastrophe. That's 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 the difference. That's that's a that's a barrier in our life. The, the, the Sunday after the catastrophe was one of the churches in uh, in, in Kamperland, the, uh, the domine, the, the, the preacher, uh, he said that's the catastrophe, that was the punishment of God. And uh, we don't believe that. We see it as a, it comes from nature and it's from all things that come together in one moment. A high tide, spring tide, uh, high water and northwest storm. And that was the reason of that, of that catastrophe. Maar men zal zich tevens herinneren hoe in een stugge worsteling die slechts tien maanden duurde, de bressen in de dijken gedicht werden en hoe snel de droogmaking van de overstroomde gebieden daarop volgde. In onze volksvertegenwoordiging werd het Delta-plan dat een ramp als die van 1953 in de toekomst moet voorkomen met vrijwel algemene stemmen aangenomen. De uitslag van de stem is dat 106 leden zeggen we verklaard voor het wetsontwerp en 8 tegen, dus dat is aangenomen. Het Delta-plan voorziet in de afsluiting van de zeearmen tussen de Zuid-Hollandse en Zeeuwse eilanden. Er zullen dammen worden gelegd in het Heiringvliet tussen Voorne en Goeré, in het Brouwershavense gat tussen Goeré en Schouwen, in de Oosterschelde tussen Schouwen en Noord-Beverland en in het Verengat. Als deze afsluitingen en de bijkomende werken voltooid zijn, zullen de bewoners achter de hoge dijken naar menselijke berekening veilig zijn voor het geweld van de zee. The main object of the Delta project was to shorten our coastline. So close off the inlets of the rivers, this one and here and there and this one. So we made several lakes and in this one the river has to go to sea. So here are big sluices so the river water can go to sea. And the Oosterschelde is a special case because we closed off several lakes. A lot of people, especially uh, from nature and from fishery, didn't want us to close the Oosterschelde into a lake. It would be a pity. So there was a big debate and in the end it was decided to make a storm surge barrier. So not really closing, but we can close it when there, we expect a storm. But on the, on the normal conditions it's open, so the water flows in and out. Al geruime tijd ligt in de mond van de Oosterschelde een tweetal werkeilanden. Voor de afsluiting van de drie stroomgeulen hebben de regering en Kamer nu gekozen voor een waterdoorlatende pijlerdam. Waarmee in het waterloopkundig laboratorium De Voorst in de Noordoostpolder uitgebreide proeven op schaal zijn genomen. De pijlerdam krijgt in totaal meer dan 80 doorstroomopeningen die bij storm met metalen schuiven kunnen worden afgesloten. Als ze openstaan blijft de getijbeweging voor ongeveer 65% gehandhaafd. Metingen in de laboratoriumopstelling hebben dit aangetoond. En dat is belangrijk voor het biologisch milieu van de Oosterschelde. Het hele project van de pijlerdam en de bijkomende werken gaat meer dan 4 miljard gulden kosten. Als alles volgens de plannen verloopt, zal de stormvloedkering in de Oosterscheldemond in 1985 gereed zijn. To build this storm surge barrier was very innovative at that time. It took quite a while. It started in the well in the mid 70s to make the plans and to build it. It was finished in 1986. De stormvloedkering in de Oosterschelde is gesloten. De Delta-werken zijn voltooid. It's so that when we expect a storm level of the water of 3 meters, the barrier is closed. So then on the North Sea the level will rise, but inside in the Oosterschelde the, le the level will stay at that, at that level of 3 meters. The barrier was built for 200 years at that time, with an expectation of sea level rise of 20 centimeters per century. But as you all know, we now expect some more sea level rise, so we don't know 
how long the barrier will last, but it will, it, it will last an, an, another century at least, and we can adapt it to make it suitable for even higher sea level rise. We can adapt it to a sea level rise of one and a half meter. Will the sea level rise then even higher? Then we have to, uh, well, re rebuild something else. But that will be a discussion for in about, well, half or one century. So we'll see then, it's far away. But now we're just thinking on how, t how we can adapt the situation uh, as it is now. We have some erosion inside because of the barrier, because less water is flowing in and out. So the equilibrium between tidal flats and shoals and the water running in and out is disturbed. So we have erosion of the intertidal areas and that's no good for nature, for the birds, and that's no good, no good for safety. So we're now experimenting with the sand nourishments and they're, go they're doing very well. So uh, we expect that in a few years we will have a plan to nourish the flats and the shoals and the forelands before the dike, so to keep them in shape for nature and safety. You can see after 16 years, 60 years after the catastrophe, they still uh, have to continue to, to make the dike stronger and stronger. And the left sea level uh, goes up, so they have to make it higher and higher. And now you can see they do it with stones in, in the water, so the, the, the waves break by the stones and then they build piece by piece or up. That was our swimming, <laughs> a romantic swimming pool. Especially the, the, the oldest one of the islands and not many tourists come here. So it is our own place, but now we can't swim. You have to, to follow the coast and to, uh, to make it always better and higher and we don't know where it ends. We're now on the Brouwers Dam. It's a dam between the North Sea, it's over there, and Lake Grevelingen. And Grevelingen was, well, part of the delta, part of the estuary of the Rhine and the Meuse and the Scheldt. And it was closed off from the sea for safety reasons. And this is one of the largest dams. It's more like a landscape. There are islands over there. They were former sand flats. There is now a, a recreational park, Port Zeelande. The lake has some problems with water quality, so we need to bring more water from the sea and refresh the water. We want to make another sluice in the dam to bring more water in the lake and out again when it's ebb tide on the outside. And we would like to combine that with a tidal power plant, so get energy out of the tidal difference and the flowing of the water. And it will be over there, so we're now uh, making plans with organizations that uh, manage power plants to find a way to realize a sluice that will also be a tidal power plant. So maybe in 2030 there will be, or 2025, there will be a, a tidal power plant over there. And then we have, we'll have a better water quality in the lake and nice blue energy. We are here with the, an old tower, it's from the village Koude Kerke. And the old church tower is uh, one of the leftovers. It's the only one from a drowned village we have in the, in the province. The village was uh, abandoned in about 1600. So people left, they, they weren't drowned, they left in time. And the, the tower was used as a lighthouse for some while. So that's one of the reasons it's still there. And uh, well, it's a good, uh, a good historic remnant of that period. It reminds us of the many floods and uh, that we always have to be uh, careful and uh, watch our dikes and storm surge barrier to keep it in good shape uh, and it's a very nice place you can go on top of it and look uh, over the Oosterschelde and on the, on the surroundings. When you look to the history of Zeeland that, that, that's, that's our ages full of catastrophes. 
lots of villages has get away in the sea. And I think it's not correct om to think that it never can happen again. And here is a chance one on one on four thousand, I think. But that can can be tomorrow, and, and it can be t about thousand years. The border between the Netherlands and Belgium runs right across a nature reserve called Het Zwin. Today it's a popular spot for tourists and local people, but it also has an interesting history. Here you got the old Zwin, and a Zwin was the entrance of the harbour of Bruges. And in, in, the, uh, in the 1300s, this uh, entrance to the sea was completely filled with sand. So there's, at first, the harbour of Brugge lost its importance because there was no more a harbour. And they had to go to Damme, which is a little city closer to the sea. And when Damme was finished, the only port that was left was Sluis, here in Holland. But the Zwin le uh, has, has been always there. And, and, and nowadays, in the middle of the Zwin, there is the border between Holland and Belgium, on the coast. With my, with my parents, when I was a little boy, I came already to this area. And we have been camping here for many years. And then we came back when, uh, when I was uh, married and we had children of our own. Because this is a nice region for, for, for children. And now our children have their own children. And now we are coming back with our grandchildren. So we like this, this area very much. At 68 kilometers, the Belgian coast has the world's longest tramway, and it connects Canoca, close to the Dutch border, with Depana, near the French border. It has, uh, between Depana and uh, Canoca, it has 68 stops where people can step on or off the tram. The coastal tram rides about 3 million kilometers a year and also transports about 30 million passengers per year. And in fact, only in July and August uh, the coastal tram already uh, transports about 4 million passengers. And you can just sit back, enjoy the view, um, there's no traffic stress, there's no parking stress. And it also has a high frequency, so in winter the, there's a, a coastal tram every 20 minutes. In spring and in autumn there's a, a coastal tram every 15 minutes and in summer every 10 minutes. This type of transport, amazingly, has over 125 years of history. In 1885, La Société Nationale des Chemins de Fer Vicinaux was created. A local tramway company, which was financed by the state, the province and the different municipalities. The tramway exploitation, however, was outsourced to private proprietors. The first tram line at the coast was from Ostend to Middelkerke and was later extended to Newport and Verna. In the beginning, the coastal tram not only transported people, but also goods, for instance, uh, agricultural products, as it also linked uh, several polar villages. The trams were also used to transport building materials. At first, the trams ran on steam, but later were converted to electric. The electric tram ran at a higher speed, but for a long time, the two systems operated alongside each other. And, uh, the steam tram was actually called the peasant tram and the uh, electric tram was called uh, the tram for the rich tourists. In 1895 the state started to work with an English product developer to create an electrical tramway running from Ostend to West End. This was the beginnings of the coastal tram we are familiar with today. 
Whereas before the trams would connect the different polder villages, the tram would now ride closer to the beach along the dunes. We are also studying the possibility of extending the tram line from Coxeda to Hörne. And apart from that, we are also uh, studying uh, the, possib the possibility of renewing the trams. Volgende halte: de Panne Esplanade. Near the end of the tram line is a small hangar which houses a museum showcasing coastal trams. The organisation, TTO Nordsee, restores and maintains historic trams. They all have been restored by people of our association. During the holidays, we have an exhibition here. And it's open every Saturday and Sunday. And this tram will go onto the streets from here to Adinkerke. And there are different trams. This one is a very old one. Yeah. From the, the 1900s, 1902, 1903. And it's also a typical coastal tram, just like this one. Only on the coast you have such a model. This tram with the two wagons here form an entity. It's the OB type. OB means Ostend Blackenburg. Because in 1900 and some, the tramway was constructed between Ostend and Blankenburg. And that was the type of trams conceived for this line. They were on the road until 1950. What we see here is what we call a baladeuse. That's a French name. A balade means walk. It's just a, a car to sit in the summer. It is open, so you need good weather. First, you had the, uh, the steep trucks. These were the, the first trams. Then here on the coast, the first electrical trams were in Ostend, and these were battery trams. So you, you, did, you didn't need an overhead cable. But uh, these batteries at that time had not a big capacity. So at that time, they transformed these trams as normal trams with an overhead. And from that time, on the coast, the most of the trams used were electrical trams. King Leopold II it was a, a king with uh, big ideas. Just uh, he gave Belgium his big colony, Congo. But also he liked to transform cities. This was in 1900, uh, all the big cities were transformed. And he liked Ostend, because this was on the sea, he liked to go on holiday. Well, on Ostend, we had our first tram line. And so, there was a tram trailer built for Leopold II. And he came by train to the station of Ostend, and in the station of Ostend, you had a tram waiting for him, with a trailer specially for him and the family, and they brought them to the king's house in Ostend. During the war, trams were used to transport soldiers and ammunition to the front line. A special model was devised that stopped steam emitting from the top, making the tram less visible to the enemy. For a lot of people, it was, it was the only mode of transport. Eh? The, the most of the people didn't have a car. Eh? 
some trams had first class seat and second class seat, so the first class was more, more expensive. But normally, uh, taking the tram was not so expensive. The tram made the coast. You see it uh, a very big impact on economical life here on the coast. Because along this tram line came new villages and cities, new houses, new buildings, new stops from the tram. So it, it really boosted the economy of the coast, the tram line. The border between Belgium and France sits alongside an old railway on the outskirts of Aldenkerke. There is a path that connects the Belgium and French dunes and next to it there is a nature reserve. Only a few kilometres from the border is a military cemetery in Zwietkut. This area is steeped in war history. One of the places with particular significance to the region is Fort de Dunes. This fort was built at the end of the 19th century, between 1878 and 1880. The style of the fort is Serré de Rivière. He was an engineer architect and he is the creator of the, this kind of fort. And the, this kind of fort was all uh, around the French border because uh, we were afraid about the German attacks. But unfortunately, uh, as soon as the fort was finished, uh, it became obsolete because uh, new weapons were invented, new explosives, and so the construction in, in brick were not secure for, for the soldier. And it was just a place to, to make military exercise. So during the First World War, nothing special happened. But during the Second World War, uh, there were French soldiers here. And uh, the, the Germans knew it, so they attacked the fort. And uh, a general died here, General Janssen, and other soldiers during the Operation Dynamo. And after that, so the, the German occupied uh, the city, the village, Le Frankouk, and the fort during all the, all the rest of the, of the war. And at the end of the war, uh, six resistants were shot here. It becomes clear why the fort is positioned here. It is strategically placed between the sea border, the floating land and the east wall in order to defend Dunkirk. At the origin, the fort was really like this, all white and with a, with a black band. Because of the light, there were just a petrol lamp, so all was white to have more light. So now, the, the team of the fort is restoring all the, all the fort like that. In this room, we put uh, an exhibition, a permanent exhibition, about uh, the architecture of the fort on this wall. And on this wall you have uh, an exhibition that, uh, that we made about the coastal battery. We 
are in what we call the Zuidcote battery. Uh, we are not in Zuidcote, we are in Le Francouc town, but uh, the name comes from the fact that this battery was supposed to defend the pass of Zuidcote here, defend the attack from the sea from this way. It was built uh, in 1878, like the Fort of the Dune, because it was the annex of the Fort of the Dune at the origin. And uh, after there was other construction by the French at the beginning of the 20th century and after by the German when they occupied all uh, the city of Dunkirk and around and it was part of the, of the Atlantic Wall. Uh, the name code from the, from, from the Zuidcote battery was uh, DALI. It was called DALI by the German here. You will see the different elements from, from the different periods. Here you can see so the first element of the original battery, which was built at the end of the 19th century. So in yellow brick, like the Fort of the Dune, that was the entrance. The structures which are in concrete and not in bricks are from all the French or the, the German. This is French and this is German. This bunker was made by the French in the year 1930. It was equipped with a telemeter, an optical tool to see the boat arrive during the Second World War. So the German also used this bunker. They built all the other bunker along the beach. So this is a, a shooting place. It was built also by the French uh, before the Second World War. And you have uh, three or four other, but now with the vegetation we, we don't see it well. This is the main bunker built by the German. We call it a wolf head because it's like kind of a wolf head. It was the main bunker after used by the, by the German to to survey the, the, the sea and prevent an attack from the sea. It was, it was bombed at the end of the war. Well, there was no attack from the sea here because the landing was in Normandy. So, but the Germans, they, they believed that the landing will arrive in North Pas de Calais, but it arrived in Normandy. So there were not attacks from the sea, but there were bombings here and uh, many soldiers died. Uh, First French in 1940 and in 1944 German, German soldier. One of the most important yet little known stories from the Second World War took place on these shores. So the Phony War ended uh, in the 10th of May 1940 when the German army uh, uh, tried to attack France from crossing Belgium and Luxembourg. They were supposed to be neutral countries but the Germans crossed them anyway. They arrived in France uh, both from, uh, from Belgium, but, but also a part of the German army crossed the Ardennes. The Allied strategy in the event of an attack against the Low Countries was to swing their armies like a gate into Belgium, the hinge being the north end of the Maginot Line. This all-important hinge was protected by the forest of the Ardennes, a hilly and thickly wooded area, honeycombed with streams, its roads narrow trails, its bridges too weak for military vehicles. French strategists estimated the forest of the Ardennes impassable for armored forces. As you will see, this was one of the costliest estimates in all military history. That was the situation on May 9, 1940. The Allied army was mostly so British soldier, French soldier, and and Bel Belgian soldier. They took them from the rear, so it was a, it was a trap. It was like a like a jaw, which closed. To avoid the loss of uh, many many men, the Allied commandment 
decide to try to evacuate the most possible soldier until the British coast. But out of the fog and the mist shrouding the channel came a strange armada of Navy craft, fishing boats, pleasure yachts, anything that would float. This operation was ordered and organized by the General uh, Ramsey, a British general from the Dover Castle. He was in a room called the Dynamo Room and so the operation took the name of Operation Dynamo. It started the 26th of May and, uh, and ended the 4th of June 1940 when the Germans arrived finally in Dunkirk. It took a lot of, uh, for example, cars, and material to create some bridge to go until the boat because there, there is a lot of sand in this coast so it's, uh, it's really difficult for the boat. Night and days there was many many boats, all the boats from maybe from the British army and also what we call the little ships, just people who wanted to help that try to evacuate many 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 men. that they managed to evacuate about 340,000 men and the German army didn't arrive straight away because Hitler uh, gave an order to this army to stop and wait. We don't know why. Of course there, there were attacks from the, from the Luftwaffe but there was also, thanks to the bombing, a lot of black, black smoke and it was a help for, for the soldiers. It was a kind of miracle that they managed to bring so, so many men in England. It was a little miracle. Louis Boulot, who is the, the survivor of the Fort of the Dunes, is still alive and he, he couldn't embark because uh, his unity, so the, the 12th uh, motorized infantry division, was cover the Operation Dynamo. When he arrived here, it was, it was too late. He said that uh, he never felt that in his life. He arrived on the beach and it's too late, there is no boat. He knows that German will arrive in a few hours and that it will be prisoner. He said that he felt so empty at this moment, he incredibly empty, like, like, like never in, in his life. He talked uh, a lot about this, uh, this period also, when he was prisoner and it was a strange period. He said that uh, Germans were very strange because they know that they, they are losing the war in 1944-45. They were still uh, like blind. Hitler died and stuff. It was impossible in, in, in their mind. But at school, when we learn about uh, World War II in France, we speak a lot of, uh, about Normandy, about resistance. But uh, this part of the history, the Operation Dynamo, is completely absent from the history book for, for children in, in, in school. If we manage to make this, uh, this part more touristical, more, more famous, maybe people will start to, to know it better. I think it's a big part of the history of the Second World War because without uh, this evacuation, we probably couldn't have uh, the landings after because all these men were, were saved. Crossing Nord Pas de Calais, the war memorials and military cemeteries are very prominent in the area. There are over a thousand Commonwealth cemeteries in this region alone. The biggest of them is in Atapla, which contains over 10,000 graves. During the First World War, the area around Atapla was the home to many enforcement camps and hospitals. You can find troops from the entire Commonwealth and the British Empire. So England, Wales, Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, um, Canada, um, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, India, uh, China, but also German soldiers that were prisoners and uh, needed uh, medical attention. Every military cemetery is officially given in perpetuity to uh, the country of the soldiers that are buried uh, in there, so technically this is British territory. Everybody is equal in death. Of course your rank is mentioned in the tombstone, but it is not recognizable in any way. It's a very important concept of, of a British military cemetery. This cemetery is a little different. Actually a military cemetery would be very straightforward, just lines and, and squares. 
this is a very special one also for this reason it's more natural more oriented towards nature You can see here a, a, a Belgian uh, tombstone from a soldier that died in uh, the 1st of January 1918. And so he was probably injured and uh, sent here if he'd been taken care of. While Atapla was quite a small town, it had about 5,000 inhabitants during the First World War, it hosted over 125,000 soldiers in a military facility. There was a military training facility called the Bull Ring where soldiers were trained for the trenches alongside hospitals where injured soldiers were sent. Training conditions were really, really hard. Officers and the NCOs in charge of the training had the reputation of never having been to the trenches. There was a lot of tension between the trainers, let's say, and, and, and the soldiers. And uh, one day, a, a soldier came back from a permission in Etap a little too late, and as a consequence was uh, considered a deserter. That was the, the spark, basically, a good enough reason to start a mutiny um, that lasted three days. The consequence of it was that uh, a, a soldier was, uh, was executed uh, in, uh, in November 1917 in uh, Boulogne. The camp and the hospitals were there also because it was far enough from the front lines so that it couldn't be bombed by planes, by German planes at least at the beginning of the war because at the end the aviation had made uh, huge improvements and now they could carry bombs and, and basically bomb th those hospitals and that's what happened in May 1918 uh, four times and it made a lot, lot, lot of casualties. One of the issues that, let's say, remembrance has is that, sadly, very few Germans come and visit, uh, whether the cemeteries or the museums, very, very few. I understand there might be some sense of, maybe not guilt, but, you know, just being uncomfortable, uncomfortable with, with the idea. I think we can get over that story of fighting each other and, and consider those places like places of peace, not of guilt. The sea binds all three countries, the Netherlands, Belgium and France. Looking out from the French shores to the United Kingdom, it is clear that the sea is the ultimate border, both connecting and dividing the different cultures.